Um, thanks very much uh, to everybody for joining us tonight and good evening. Um, welcome to this evening's webinar program focused on NRCM's top priorities in the Maine State Legislature and beyond in 2022. We would have loved to have been with you in person for this program, of course, uh, but we appreciate that you've adapted and joined us here online instead for this program. I speak for everybody at NRCM uh, that we hope that you and your families are safe and healthy during these challenging times we're all living. My name is Todd Martin. I'm the Grassroots Outreach Coordinator at the Natural Resources Council of Maine. NRCM is a nonprofit membership organization protecting, restoring, and conserving Maine's environment now and for future generations. For 63 years, NRCM has been protecting the places and the way of life that make Maine such a special place to live, work, and play. NRCM harnesses the power of the law, science, and the voices of more than 25,000 members and supporters in Maine, around the country, and beyond. We have a staff of 26, and our office is located in Augusta, just steps from the State House, although our staff continues to mostly work remotely. Uh, before we jump into this evening's program, just a couple of quick reminders about the Zoom webinar platform that we're using this evening. Um, so first, this program is being recorded. Tomorrow, you'll receive a follow-up email uh, with a link to the recording of this webinar. And we hope that you'll share that with friends and family who are unable to join us today. Uh, your video and your audio is disabled this evening by design. So you'll only be able to see and hear our panelists this evening. But if you have a question uh, during the program or for any of our panelists, please type that question in the Q&A box, which you can find on the lower ribbon of your Zoom screen. And we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers uh, at the end of our program. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Pete Didesheim, NRCM's uh, Advocacy Director, to share his perspective on the state legislative session and the challenges and opportunities ahead. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so let me also welcome all of you um, and thank you for being part of this webinar. And I look at the list of people who have uh, signed on and it includes former staff, current and former board members and some wonderful activists from around the state who have really made a huge difference in helping protect uh, Maine. So thank you for being engaged. Thank you for your interest in what happens at the State House. Um, without your help, we would not have accomplished nearly as much as we have in recent years. Um, Todd, why don't you go to the next slide? So this is the view from my window. I'm looking out at the Capitol right now. It's got its lights on. This is an exciting part of the year where the Legislative session has just begun, and there's a lot of possibility and determination uh, to contribute to our legacy of protecting Maine's environment. As you know, this is the second session of the 130th legislature. It began last week, and um, I like looking over the state house. It gives me a pretty good view. Um, and NRCM spends a lot of time under the dome. Um, we'll be doing that mostly virtual, virtual again this session. Um, but we do play a significant role throughout the, the uh, legislative process trying to, to pass good laws, and we're going to be discussing some of those opportunities today. But let me just start the next slide by um, flagging that um, a big part of 2022 is going to be focused on implementation of the legislation that we passed last year. Last year was a banner year probably the most successful year for environmental legislation in my 25 years working as NRCM's advocacy director. I said this in 2019, and that was a really big year, but last year we passed more than two dozen bills, and those deal with uh, extended producer responsibility for packaging, um, land for Maine's future, federal funding for water projects and state parks and energy efficiency, a bunch of bills dealing with the Climate Action Plan, um, toxics. Um, there's a lot of implementation work that needs to happen this year by state agencies. And it's important to just acknowledge that a lot of what is important in our world is includes passing bills and then making sure that they're implemented well. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. Next slide. 
So this is the emergency session. Lawmakers have about 350 bills that they're gonna be working on over the next three to three and a half months. Next slide. And let me just touch on some of the challenges in this upcoming session. The pandemic is clearly causing additional disruptions. All public hearings will be conducted via Zoom uh, as they were last year. There's uncertainty about how many in-person sessions there'll be of the, of the House and Senate and when they'll start. There's one more this month on the 26th. And this makes it more difficult for us to do our grassroots and direct lobbying with lawmakers. The second challenge we face is that there was so much winning in recent years across all of these different issues that there isn't a long list of bills that we haven't implemented, um, we haven't passed. So we do have some really good opportunities this year, but the list is shorter than usual because we've done such a good job. And election year politics is definitely gonna cause some disruption in uh, the lawmaking process, the legislative process, the national and governor's race backdrop, all of the House races and all the Senate races are up. There, that means there's gonna be increased partisanship and quite an eagerness to adjourn and get out onto the campaign trail. So these are challenges that we'll face uh, in the upcoming session. Next slide. So as I said, uh, public hearings are gonna be done by Zoom. Um, these are three snapshots just this week of what public hearings look like. The one up uh, on the upper left is uh, Melanie testifying on a, a bill earlier this week. Uh, dealing with Bureau of Parks and Lands uh, proposal to transfer some 2,000 acres to Baxter State Park, which we support, and 4,000 acres they want to sell in divided interest um, near the Allagash, and we are raising a bunch of concerns about that. The image to the right in the middle is a former NRCM staff member, um, advocacy director now at Maine Audubon, uh, Eliza uh, Donahue, and she's testifying on a bill dealing with invasive species in Maine lakes. And Nick Bennett is in the lower slide and he's testing on a, testifying on a bill just a couple of days ago dealing with uh, stormwater runoff and how it affects the classification of Maine's rivers. Next slide. So one thing I just wanna bring your attention to, if you, if you want to watch a hearing while it's happening or watch the recording of any hearing that's happened, you can do that by going to the Maine Legislature's YouTube channel and pulling up a committee by name and all of the recordings are there. This is one of the great benefits of the virtual experience that we're in right now is that you can watch hearings live, you can scroll backwards and watch parts that you've missed, or you can go to the hearing at some future point and watch it. So that's a great archive and resource that is very valuable to us. Next slide. And I just wanna say that from our perspective, the most important part of our work is to building relationships, relationships with all of you, also relationships with the legislators who are citizen lawmakers. They're not doing it for the money. It's really hard work. And we do um, respect and value all the relationships that we develop with legislators. And we try to find common ground with all of them. So I just wanna, before I hand the, the um, podium, the mic off, just want to encourage folks to know your legislators, develop a relationship, and, and talk to them um, uh, however you can <laughs> through emails or phone calls or directly in person to try to um, influence them on the issues we'll be describing today and any other issues that are of concern to you because their job is to represent us at the State House. So why don't I now hand it over to Melanie, who's going to talk about one of our top priorities. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. My name is uh, Melanie Sturm. I'm the Forest and Wildlife Director. My main focus this legislative session is LD 736. It's a bill that seeks to expand Maine's ecological reserve system. Uh, Maine's ecological reserve system was created by law in 2000 with the purposes of conserving wildlife habitat, providing educational and research opportunities, and serving as benchmarks for environmental and biological change on the landscape. And actually NRCM had a big role to play in getting that original law passed. Today, a handful of public and private organizations manage land as ecological reserves in Maine. You can see here, um, these are 
ecological reserves managed by the Bureau of Parks and Lands. There are 19 of them covering approximately 97,000 acres. And while these parcels are small, um, combined they cover less than 1% of the state's land mass. They are habitat strongholds in a matrix of forests and lands managed for other purposes that help safeguard Maine's biodiversity. Next slide. Todd, you can flip through the next six slides um, at your leisure. These photos are of ecological res reserves that you may recognize. Um, eco reserves are important for multiple reasons. I, as I was just mentioning, they protect biodiversity in the face of accelerating species loss and help mitigate climate change. And in fact, they sequester 30% more above ground carbon on average than other lands. Ecological reserves also offer premier outdoor recreation opportunities, plus they help improve our scientific understanding of the natural world. The ecological reserve system was actually designed to be a network of public and private lands that maintain an effective example of the full range of habitat types found in Maine. This theme of saving all the pieces I'll bring up later. Um, ecological reserves are diverse, as you can see, but they are mostly located in northern Maine, the western mountains, and down east. And a recent report from the state of Maine found that currently none of the seven ecoregions in the state has adequate representation of all habitat types within, the eco within ecological reserves or similarly managed lands. And while there are conservation lands in southern Maine, Habitats in the southern region of the state are drastically underrepresented in the ecological reserve system, leaving many species vulnerable. So if the ecological reserve system were to be expanded, as we're aiming for, new reserves in southern Maine would actually mean increased outdoor access in that part of the state where much of the population lives. Uh, you can stay on this slide, Todd, because I'm going to talk about um, the bill we're working on this session, LD 736, which is sponsored by Representative Nicole Grahowski of Ellsworth, um, it would improve the existing law and allow for the expansion of the ecological reserve system. The current law caps the size of the system at 100,000 acres and sets other arbitrary size limits. And there are significant gaps that remain in protecting Maine's habitat types. LD 736 would adjust the statutory size cap and ensure existing ecological reserves remain in place. And it's imperative this change to the law happen now. Uh, lots of progress has been made in the past 21 years to build out the ecological reserve system. As you saw, 97,000 acres of public lands are managed by BPL and are now protected as reserves, but work still needs to be done to achieve protection for effective examples of all habitat types. Um, ecological reserves can help Maine reach its climate goals. We have a 30 by 30 goal here in Maine that's in the Climate Action Plan. And um, these reserves can also curb the decline of native species um, that is a global, that is a problem that's happening globally and touching down here in Maine. Next slide. When talking about the eco reserve system, Aldo Leopold often comes up. He wrote, Quote, to keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. Mainers had that same idea when they helped create the ecological reserve system to maintain an effective example of all the habitat types or to save all the pieces like I've been talking about. And with the theme of saving all the pieces, NRCM commissioned a set of illustrations to showcase the unique natural features that can be found on some of the 19 ecological reserved. And Zoe Keller, Look Her Up um, is a Portland-based artist who did these seven illustrations for us. And in the drawings, you can see common species like moose, red squirrel, bald eagle, as well as rare ones like Bicknell's thrust, thrush, excuse me, beaked sedge, Quebec emerald dragonfly, and alpine blueberry. And you'll also see species that are unique to Maine like Arctic char and others that are just a joy to come across like blue flag iris, uh, old growth trees, and yellow banded bumblebee. Um, these species are some of many that are protected by eco reserves. And because of the compounding threats to our environment, we need more of these. Thank you for listening. I'd be glad to answer any questions you have about ecological reserves or LD 736 later on. All right. 
I guess that means I'm up. Thank you so much, Melanie. And thank you so much to everybody for spending your Thursday evening with us. Uh, my name is Sarah Nichols and I'm the Sustainable Maine Director at NRCM. And I'm going to tell you the horrible tale of the out-of-state waste loophole and how we're going to close it. So in case you missed it, um, I regret to inform you that Maine is a dumping ground right now for New England. And um, every year, um, most of this waste is coming from Massachusetts, uh, about uh, two to 300,000 tons per year being trucked into our state and um, corporations are profiting from this waste being dumped here. Um, we believe it's time to close this loophole once and for all, um, and as the state of Maine intended. Oh, you can change the side now. Todd, I just want to try to do it myself. Thank you. So um, I'm just going to tell you a quick story about how we got here because it makes it especially frustrating for um, this whole situation. So in 1989, uh, the state of Maine recognized that um, we were poised to become a dumping ground for all of New England as states around us were strengthening their waste laws. Um, so they passed uh, groundbreaking legislation, which included a ban on, uh, on all new commercial landfills. And that was essentially to prevent us bring, from being filled without a state waste. Then 2004 rolls along, the state of Maine purchased a uh, Juniper Ridge landfill in um, uh, just north of Old Town. And um, again, for the explicit, explicit purpose of making sure that it wasn't filled with waste from out of state. If it's a state owned landfill, we can say what goes in there without violating the federal commerce clause. So that's why we bought it. But the loophole is this, uh, waste can come in from out of state, stop at any one of our solid waste processing facilities. Um, and all of these facilities are going to have residue coming out of them. Um, there's one facility in particular where 90% of the material they take in is from out of state. And just coincidentally, actually 90% of what they send out is um, some kind of residue. So it's basically a transfer is where this uh, disguise gets put on out of state waste to be sent to Juniper Ridge. And that's resulted in about um, about a third of the Juniper Ridge landfill is being filled from with waste from out of state. Actually, Todd, you can go to the next slide, I think, for this part. So, um, you know, so this is not a small amount. It's not a it's not a little problem um, that amounts to uh, 16 40 ton tractor trailer trucks every single day of the year coming over Maine's borders with waste destined for for uh, Juniper Ridge landfill. Um, this landfill has increased um, its landfilling rate of about like 32% faster than the state thought it was going to um, when they bought it. It's um, necessitated landfill expansions. Um, the people that live around the landfill are rightfully um, upset about this um, situation as, you know, at, at this rate, the landfill will have to be expanded again in about six and a half years. And when you look at the graph of how much waste is going in there, it's just increasing over time. And we, we really need to put a stop to it um now okay you can go to the next slide please todd okay this is a cartoon out of um uh when this law was being covered last year um so there's there's two couple people are always asking me so why would anybody want maine to be a dumping ground for for you know new england like why who's who's opposed to this and the answer is um uh casella uh waste company they are the they're the company who manages the landfill for the state. Um, they profit off of more and more waste being being dumped there. And of course, the facility that's being used as the uh, that's putting the disguise on the waste, um, they profit as well. And they're trying to convince lawmakers that the state of Maine actually benefits from being filled with, with waste from out of state. Um, but they're, um, you know, which is disingenuous and, um, and, and they're wrong. Um, you can go to the next slide, please, Todd. So uh, this bill, um, LD 1639, is being sponsored by um, Senator Ann Carney from Cape Elizabeth. Uh, it did have a public hearing last spring, and it was one of the last bills that the Environment and Natural Resources Committee heard, and um, they decided to hold it over uh, to give it the, the time and care and attention that it deserves. Um, a work session will be coming up um, very soon, where we're expecting the committee to, to vote on this bill. and. Um, you know, if we're able to get this out of the committee, we need—we really do need all hands on deck. These uh, the, the companies who are are profiting off of this waste are um, dead set on keeping the status quo, and they're well funded. And um, 
and we need all of the you know grassroots rest stops all the everybody working together to get this bill passed so again i'm happy to answer questions um at the end and thank you very much for your time all right it's my turn hi everybody uh, thanks so much for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Jack Shapiro. I'm the Climate and Clean Energy Director here at NRCM, uh, and I'm going to talk about LD 1350, uh, sponsored by Senator Eloise Vitelli, uh, and it is a bill that will bring hundreds of megawatts of new renewable energy capacity onto the grid in Maine. Um, you can go to the next slide, Todd. Thank you. Um, so first I wanna start with a bit of context on where this bill fits into our overall climate policy picture in Maine. Uh, because we have made a lot of progress on climate and energy over the past three years as, as Pete sort of hinted at. There's way too many things to point to in the limited time we have, but I wanna highlight three things in particular. Um, first is in 2019, Maine set statutory, that is legally binding targets to cut greenhouse gas emissions by 45% by 2030 and by 80% by 2050. That's overall emissions cuts, no, no offsets, no, no accounting tricks. Second, uh, we increased our renewable energy targets to 80% renewables by 2030 and 100% renewables by 2050. Now to hit those targets, a bipartisan majority in the legislature and Governor Mills created the Maine Climate Council, which in turn created Maine's Climate Action Plan titled Maine Won't Wait, in December of 2020. Now, this is a ambitious, it's a wide ranging plan. It includes ways that will start to tackle eliminating dirty fossil fuels and pollution from our electric grid, but also uh, how we might clean up uh, other large sources like our cars and trucks and how we heat our buildings and um, a bunch of other sources of greenhouse gas uh, pollution as well. LD 1350 will task the Maine Public Utilities Commission, the PUC, uh, with procuring a new round of renewable energy projects uh, to help meet uh, these goals. Uh, next slide, Todd. All right, so because of the policies I just talked about and, and other policies that we passed, thanks to our work at NRCM, our work of our partners and, and the work of NRCM members and supporters, we have been really successful in fostering a booming solar industry here in Maine. Um, this chart shows uh, the rapid growth we've seen in solar, um, and you can see installed solar basically quadrupled in just the past few years. Next slide. But we are going to need more solar to hit our targets, more solar and other renewable energy. So this chart is um, a little bit of a, a wonkier one, but it it's from the governor's energy office earlier this year from a, a report that they did. And the blue area on this chart shows the gap that we still need to fill uh, to be able to meet our renewable energy and climate goals. And LD 1350 uh, is a big uh, way that we are going to fill that gap. Uh, next slide. So hitting our goals, obviously that's important, but we also need to remember why we have all of these goals in the first place. Uh, what are the specific benefits of, of new renewables uh, and of LD, 13, LD 1350 in particular? So first, uh, new renewables, it, it grows our supply of affordable, stable, and reliable clean energy. Fossil fuels are subject to supply shortages. They are uh, prices influenced by global market swings that we, we have no control over. Um, and we can see what, what, uh, what results from that just by looking at what's happening with heating prices this winter. Renewables, on the other hand, don't rely on fuels at all. Uh, and they help keep prices stable uh, for Maine families, particularly important for, for seniors uh, and, and for, for low-income Maine people. Uh, next is that the process that LD 1350 lays out is a competitive bid process run by the PUC, and it's worked over and over in the past few years to bring more low-cost wind and solar onto the grid in Maine. Um, with this bill in particular, we're also working with uh, partners uh, on an amendment to have this PUC consider project siting attributes that minimize impacts to our natural resources, ecosystems, wildlife, and farmland uh, as part of the selection process, which is, a, which is a big opportunity that we have in this, uh, in this session. Okay, second big thing, it's, it's no secret anymore that switching to a clean energy economy is a, is a big economic win. Uh, 
renewable projects can be hugely beneficial for local communities. Uh, the last big renewable procurements uh, that the PUC held, for example, are estimated to bring nearly $9 million a year in tax revenues for host communities. Um, that's money that will fund schools, water and sewer systems, fill potholes, and meet other crucial infrastructure needs uh, in those communities. And making the transition to clean energy is also going to be a lot of work, and that means jobs um, uh, for Maine people. So this bill ensures that we continue to grow our clean energy workforce, um, which builds on the already um, progress we've already made. You know, more than 11,000 Mainers already uh, work in the in the clean energy clean energy industry. Um, and and then last part here is that new renewable projects in Maine also help cut down on the literally billions of dollars that flow out of our state every year to buy fossil fuel energy. Um, and that's money that um, would be much better uh, circulating here in, in Maine. The third big thing, of course, is climate change. Uh, it's no secret that climate change is here. Um, just yesterday, we saw news that the waters in the Gulf of Maine broke heat records again this fall. Um, we're seeing local ski areas having to rely on snowmaking where once they could count on natural snowfall, more extreme rains uh, bring more flooding and damage to our infrastructure. Uh, plant and animal species are, are uh, forced north with rising temperatures. Um, the bottom line is we have to act now. And expanding clean energy really is the backbone of Maine's plan to act on climate. Uh, not only does it cut greenhouse gas pollution immediately, uh, but clean energy also enables us to electrify and decarbonize our, our cars and trucks, how we heat our homes and businesses, um, and, and push uh, polluting fossil fuels out of, of our economy. So renew, uh, re new renewables, really, it's the critical path to meeting our climate goals and avoiding some of the uh, worst impacts of climate change. Um, so I will wrap up with the, the final note that Maine's Climate Action Plan is called Maine Won't Wait for a Reason. Uh, we can't wait and we shouldn't wait to pass LD 1350 to expand Maine's clean energy economy. Um, and with that, I will pass it over to Nick. Um, thanks everyone. Nick, it's all yours. Hi everybody, thanks for joining us tonight. <clears throat> My name is Nick Bennett. I'm the staff scientist and healthy waters director at NRCM. Um, there are two uh, important water related bills that um, we'll be tracking very closely this legislative session. Um, one is a good bill and one is a bad bill. And I'll talk about the bad bill first because that's just the kind of guy I am. Um, and uh, it is a bill that would block the state of Maine from recommending or promoting dam removals. Um, NRCM has worked now for more than two decades on dam removals and river restoration in the Kennebec River. And um, unfortunately, above Waterville, there are four very large dams that block sea run fish. Um, there's completely uh, inadequate passage for fish to get above those dams. Um, and in particular, this is a big problem for Atlantic salmon. Uh, the only spawning habitat, um, or rather the, the first spawning habitat that's available to Atlantic salmon um, as they come from the ocean is above all of these four dams. So right now, um, uh, this is the third dam on the river, the Shamit Dam. Todd, you can go to the next slide. Um, these are all four of the dams. Uh, above Waterville. Right now at the first dam uh, on the river in Waterville, which you can see on the top left, um, fish are trapped and trucked uh, above the dam. Um, the Kennebec used to be the most productive sea run uh, fish river in the state of Maine um, with runs of salmon in the hundreds of thousands. Um, probably it was the most productive sea run fish river in the United States. Um, that run of Atlantic salmon um, in the Kennebec has gone from hundreds of thousands to about 20 to 30 fish each year. Um, and that's a tragedy. Uh, the fish are on the edge of extirpation and in this river and extinction in the United States. Um, there is no more important river to restore uh, 
Atlantic salmon's ability to access good spawning and rearing habitat than on the Kennebec. Next slide, Todd. Um, and this is uh, where that good spawning and rear rearing habitat is in the Sandy River, um, which comes into the Kennebec uh, above Skowhegan. Unfortunately, there is a bill that's going to uh, be heard this legislative session um, from Brookfield, uh, the owner of these four dams, that's going to try to make it much more difficult for the state of Maine to uh, require good fish passage or support removal of dams. We still don't know how Brookfield is going to do this or propose to do this, but we know they are. And um, it's hard enough for salmon uh, as it is right now. We don't need the state of Maine to be unable to participate in the federal processes under the Endangered Species Act and the Federal Power Act that are going to govern uh, restoration initiatives at these four dams. And so we need to win on this bill so that Maine can continue to play a positive role in restoring sea run fish to the Kennebec River and all of our rivers. If Brookfield gets its way, Maine is not gonna be able to do that anymore. Next slide. Um, this is just a picture of uh, successfully restored alewives. Um, I'd encourage folks to go take a look um, at the Sebastocook River below Benton Falls or at uh, the river uh, uh, that goes into Damariscotta Lake at Damariscotta Mills. Um, watching these fish is just incredible. And these alewives are the easiest of the sea run fish to restore. They come back quickly if you just get out of their way and they're incredibly important. They're incredibly beautiful. They feed just about every species um, that eats fish. And without them, there's no way we can restore Atlantic salmon either. You've got to restore all the species that co-evolved with Atlantic salmon in order to restore them because Atlantic salmon have always been relatively few in number. And if you only have runs of Atlantic salmon, then the predators pick them off and you're basically sunk in terms of trying to restore their population. Next slide. This is just a, a slide showing how incredible the ale uh, restoration on the Kennebec has been. That's largely due to the removal of Edwards Dam and the removal of the Fort Halifax Dam. And you can see that this uh, fish run from the year 2008 when Fort Halifax was removed until um, 2021, you can see just how, how incredible um, the explosion of life has been in the Kennebec and the Sebastocook. Um, more than 40 million alewives have reached um, their spawning grounds in Sebastocook Lake because of the removal of these two dams. Uh, and um, you can see how poor those alewife runs were before their removals. So we want Maine to be able to continue to remove hydropower dams that are not playing a useful role because their energy production is small in relation to the amount of damage that they do to the air environment. And we have to stop this bill that's going to uh, uh, try to make it hard for Maine to play that kind of role anymore. Next slide. The second bill uh, that's water related that we'll be focusing on this year is the state's triennial water reclassification package. And that sounds like a whole bunch of gobbledygook, but essentially uh, every year the state reviews its waters and their water quality classifications, which are um, the legal and regulatory standards that uh, apply to uh, particular waters and determine the amount of pollution that's allowed to go into them. Um, and uh, each year the state proposes to upgrade classifications uh, and the protections that go with them. Um, sorry, every three years the state is, is required to do this. Um, and this particular year they're proposing 800 miles of upgrades. Um, of particular importance to NRCM are the upgrades from A to AA that they are proposing for um, tributaries to the Sandy River, which are incredible salmon spawning and rearing habitat. And upgrading those from A to AA will make sure that they are not dammed in the future and that they are kept as clean as possible 
so that they will be able to function as salmon spawning habitat far into the future. But there are many other great upgrade proposals in this package. This bill will be a department bill, uh, an administration bill. Um, and uh, we expect um, that it will, it will pass uh, the legislature because these reclassification bills usually do. But there's always someone who doesn't want to see protection of our uh, rivers and streams increased. And so this is, this is an extremely important bill for us to follow and make sure that it, it succeeds. Uh, next slide. And uh, there's no uh, better year to be pushing for a bill like this reclassification proposal and to be fighting a bill that will move us backwards on protecting clean water in Maine than the 50th uh, anniversary of the Clean Water Act, which uh, Maine's own Senator uh, Ed Muskie authored uh, back in 1972. So we will uh, also be having events to celebrate that 50th anniversary. And we will certainly point that uh, the uh, 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 importance of this particular year out to the legislature as we work on these two bills in the upcoming session. I think with that slide, I am uh, turning it back to Pete. Great, thanks Nick and thank everybody else. I'm just gonna touch on a few more bills that are high priority for us and then I'll also touch a couple issues that we're focused on outside of the legislature. Uh, the tribal sovereignty bill is pending before the Judiciary Committee. This is LD 1626. This is an important bill that would amend Maine law to restore the inherent right of the Passamaquoddy tribe, the Penobscot Nation, and the Holton Band of the Maliseets to self-govern within their territories in accordance with the same federal laws that govern tribal lands associated with 570 federally recognized tribes. This bill is crafted from the recommendations of a task force, the Task Force on Changes to the Maine Indian Claim Settlement Implementation Act. And those recommendations came forward in January 2020. The bill was moving forward, then the pandemic hit. It, um, it's been sitting in, in the Judiciary Committee. There will be amendments, and we sincerely hope that the administration and uh, lawmakers working with the tribes can um, reach agreement on a version of this bill that can be passed into law this year. Next slide. As I mentioned earlier, NRCM is tracking about 50 bills, and I'll just want to touch on four of them here. There's a climate education bill, LD 1902. This would create a three-year pilot program to provide grants for professional development for educators on climate science and to support interdisciplinary climate education. We clearly want our um, children of today, our leaders of tomorrow, to have a deep grounding in climate science. The hearing on this bill is going to be on January 25th. There's a bill that um, deals with uh, PFAS. Um, it, 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 these are the forever chemicals, LD 1911. This would the, one of the bills would close a loophole that allows PFAS contaminated commercial composting materials to be spread on farmland and uh, a hearing on that is coming up um, soon. There's also a bill that would uh, LD 1579 that as written would establish goals and timetables for the state and municipalities to transition their public fleet vehicles to electric vehicles with a goal of 100% by 2040. That bill likely will be amended, but we'll be following that one closely. There's also the Pine Tree Amendment, which many um, environmental advocates and others are following, LD 489. This would amend the Maine Constitution to grant uh, Maine people the right to a clean and healthy environment. It would need a two-thirds vote in the House and Senate to um, approve it and send it to the voters uh, for them to amend the Constitution. Next slide. Then there's a lot of issues beyond the State House, and uh, there's all those implementation bills that I was implementation uh, measures that I mentioned earlier, but there's, of course, the CMP corridor. It's been stopped as a result of question one that went into law uh, you know, on uh, December 19th, uh, but it will still play out in the courts over the next six months. It will play out there in four different venues. Uh, we've appealed the Army Corps of Engineers permit. Uh, we've appealed the Board of Environmental Protection permit. That's gonna be heard on February 16th. Um, there's also the Avangrid case uh, where they've sued the state 
Uh, that one is going to um, have oral briefs in April, April 20th, um, oral argument in May, and a decision in the middle or end of the summer. And there's also the case dealing with um, the illegal lease uh, across public lands. Um, that's the so-called um, Black v. Cutco case. And uh, that one also is going to be um, moving ahead with a possible ruling this spring. But there's other issues. Um, the Climate Action Plan is being implemented in a bunch of different ways through the agencies. There's critical issues that are on the docket at the Public Utilities Commission, also at the Land Use Planning Commission. Uh, there's a controversial um, American Aqua Farms proposal in Frenchman's Bay, which we're following closely, and permits are pending before two agencies on that. And there's a lot more, and this is all by way of saying there's really never a dull moment in the work that we do, and there's never a lack of opportunities to be involved and to help make a difference. And at this juncture, I just want to give a shout out to two people I just saw that were on the um, on this webinar. One is a intern, a Bates intern, who is um, has logged on from the opposite side of the planet, Taiwan, and um, she's going to be active, she says, in advocating for our bills this legislative session from Taiwan. I think this may be the furthest away person that um, has been a, uh, on one of our webinars. And also Jim Boyle, who was just recently elected uh, to represent Gorham as a new state legislator in a special session, a special election that just happened. Next slide. So with that, let me just again, thank all of you for the work that you do and the work that we collectively do uh, with all of our allies and all of our supporters uh, to help protect uh, the state of Maine that we love for today and future generations. So why don't we stop here and Todd is gonna field some questions um, to us. And a few of your questions, I think we've been also trying to answer um, online while this has been playing out. Great, thanks very much, Pete. And thanks to everyone else uh, for your excellent work at the State House and beyond to protect the nature of Maine. We've got about 20 minutes for questions. Uh, if folks have questions, please type them in the Q&A box and we'll get through as many of them as we can. Um, let's get down through our questions here. Let's see. Um, so there's a first quick question from uh, Kimberly Simmons. Are there projects to help reduce pollution overall? Um, including regionally, uh, not just to keep it out of Maine. So efforts to just reduce the overall amount of trash that we're, we're creating. How about Sarah, I pitch that question over to you. Yeah, hi, yeah, that's a good question. Um, thank you for it. Um, well, I mean, there's th this particular waste, I don't, didn't really dive into it much um, in my short time is uh, construction demolition debris. So this, this is, more tricky types of waste where buildings are just crushed and everything's thrown in a truck and trucked up up to Maine. Um, there are ways that we can um, put pressure on um, re you know reducing the toxicity and the amount and maybe breaking down buildings better um, but that, that's like a slow going process um, to do that and it's only laws like this that are gonna gonna lead to that. Um, and I'll say that the other states around us have strengthened their laws around construction demoli demolition debris waste. Um, so Massachusetts has banned the disposal of it there, which is part of the reason it's all getting funneled up here. So the more we all strengthen our laws, the more um, pressure it puts uh, to do those kinds of things. Um, but just in waste in general, um, I think Maine's really leading the way and we're working closely with our counterparts in um, the rest of the country and in New England, um, you know, with the EPR for packaging law, that's gonna be transformative and helping to um, not only fund recycling programs, but get the producers of all of the waste to redesign their uh, packaging materials so that it's less wasteful and we have more reuse. Um, so I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop there because I could go on and on, but I'll stop myself. Great, thanks Sarah. Um, Melanie, I'm going to pitch this next question over to you. Um, question is from William. The question is, I'm curious about the status of the forest carbon bill that would make it easier for landowners to get credit for carbon sequestration on their lands. Can you give us an update on, on that bill? Um, I wasn't aware of a piece of legislation that would do that. I do know that um, the main forest carbon task force um, kind of spun off from the main climate council. Um, and that would that that task force was made some recommendations to um, create a voluntary 
forest carbon program here in Maine that um, could potentially benefit um, small to mid-sized landowners in Maine, but those are, as far as I know, are just still recommendations and um, no, there, there's no next steps. So I, if there's a bill, please put maybe the LD number in the chat and I, I will look it up. Thank you. Great, thanks, Melanie. Um, Nick, I'm gonna pitch this next question over to you, although I think I can answer it myself. Uh, question is from Stephen. Um, what are the LD numbers uh, for the two water-related bills uh, that you mentioned? Um, my understanding is that neither of those bills have yet been printed, so they don't have bill numbers assigned to them. Is that, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, but we anticipate those bills will be printed in the next couple of weeks and uh, they'll be heard by, um, by the legislature in the coming weeks. Um, and I can jump in here that NRCM, our website has a bill tracking page uh, where we uh, include the bills that we're following, any updates about the committee hearings or work sessions, the dates, um, what our position is on those bills, or a link to our testimony or fact sheets. And if you just go into your search engine and just enter NRCM bill tracking, it should take you right to that page. So as soon as those two bills receive a bill number and are printed, they will, be, uh, they will appear there. Great, thanks, Pete. Um, Sarah, there's another question here for you from our friend Vanessa at EcoMaine. Um, question is, is there legislation uh, upcoming to re require the use of post-consumer content in packaging uh, as a follow-up to our uh, extended producer responsibility law that we passed last year? Yes, and um, those types of laws are good sister laws, I believe, to the EPR for packaging system. So that's a, basically a demand side intervention. You want, if we want recycling to work, we need to, you know, to have demand for those materials that are going through our municipal systems. Um, there is one bill, it was LD 1467, that um, passed through the legislature, we just need to get it off the appropriations table, and that um, would establish a minimum recycled content standard for plastic beverage containers only, um, but it's 25% by 2026 and 30% by 2031. A few other states have done that, and um, my crystal ball tells me that um, state of Maine and other states are going to you're going to start seeing a lot more recycled content um, legislation rolling around. But the tricky part with that is making sure that um, there's um, we need to make sure it's not toxic, basically. Um, <laughs> so uh, we can do that. But that's just something important to do. Thank you, Vanessa. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Jack, I'm going to pitch this next question over to you. Uh, I see that you already answered it uh, by typing an answer, um, but the question is from uh, Nancy. Hassenfuss, who I believe ha has a, a son that serves in the state legislature. Uh, but the question is, um, I understand the goals of LD 1350, uh, but how specifically uh, will we do that? How specifically will we procure new renewable energy in Maine? Yeah, yeah. So the way that it, uh, the way that it works is that the legislature uh, directs the Public Utilities Commission, the PUC, um, to conduct a, um, uh, conduct a solicitation and then, and then select uh, projects from the, the list of, of projects that apply that best meet the criteria that are that are laid out. Um, and those criteria are also laid out in the bill. Um, many, uh, much of the criteria is about ratepayer benefits. Uh, LD 1350, as it was drafted in the, um, in the first, first session of this session, um, also includes um, a good chunk around economic benefits. We're very interested in, in an amendment that would also include uh, natural resource impacts uh, as some of the siting, uh, as some of the criteria by which the PUC would, would select those projects. But once those projects are selected, the PUC directs the, the utilities to, to contract with those projects to, to buy the power. Um, and they've done this several times uh, in the past few years. Um, with, with really with, with great success, bringing uh, some of the costs for, for the energy coming in through these projects is just a, a, a few cents per, uh, uh, per kilowatt hour, um, far, far below actually what the sort of spot prices are right now on the, in the New England power market. So really, it does really have a big impact in helping to insulate main uh, rate payers against uh, some of these wild swings in, in fossil fuel prices that were that we're seeing right now and are responsible for some of the recent rate hikes. Great, thanks. Um, and Jack, I'm gonna stick with you for these next for this next question. There's a couple of questions here um, about uh, our grid and if it can handle this big influx of renewable energy. Of course, we all support uh, increasing our uh, adoption and use of renewables, uh, but can our grid handle it? Um, 
you know, how, how are we going to uh, improve Maine's grid uh, for, for our clean energy future? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, you know, the, we've seen this issue pop up in a, in a big way in the past, past 12 months as some of the, um, you know, I, I shared that chart of, of rapidly increasing solar. And one of the things that's come with that is, is some challenges with, with what they call interconnections, uh, getting, those, uh, getting those projects plugged into uh, to the grid. Usually the way that it works is that the project developers actually are responsible for um, upgrades to the local substations um, where, they, where they plug in those, those projects. Um, and what the issue that we saw earlier uh, in 2021 was that CMP was vastly overestimating the cost uh, that they were charging to developers to be able to, to do this. Um, but so two, two points that I would make. One is that having the, de having the developers you know, share the cost of those grid upgrades um, is one of the ways that we uh, make sure that the, the grids are able to, to handle this um, to handle this, and those are those are baked into the prices which they offer into the into the competitive procurements. Um, but I think there is a broader point about um, that that we do need a more uh, more deliberate, holistic uh, transmission and distribution grid planning process uh, in Maine and in New England and and generally speaking in the in the country. Um, there's some resources that were dedicated to that in the infrastructure bill that was uh, that was passed last year, um, but it's going to take a lot a lot more resources, but also a lot better process, um, so that we can um, really think about what is the grid that we want to have that is powered by uh, renewable energy um, that's more distributed um, and uh, and provides more community benefits. Um, rather than sort of big, big fossil fuel plants um, pumping out power across uh, uh, one way um, from, from power plant to, to people across the, across the grid. So there's definitely a lot of work to be done there. Great. Thanks very much, Jack. And I guess uh, sticking with a grid question, Pete, I'll pitch this next question over to you. There's a few questions in the chat about um, the potential for a consumer-owned utility and, and NRCM's uh, position on uh, on potentially uh, buying out our private utilities and, and replacing it with a consumer owned utility. Pete, can you just share a little bit about our, our position on that? Uh, well, we have testified in support of a consumer owned utility when the bill was pending at the state house. And we definitely support the concept, um, but we also recognize that getting there could be a very significant challenge. Um, it is really the existential threat to central main power in Versant. Uh, we have been involved in a pretty intense um, campaign to try to stop the CMP corridor. So we understand um, how challenging it is to, to, um, to go head to head with CMP and its parent company. We have not really had the capacity to be involved in the, in the signature gathering campaign and uh, that our power has been pursuing, but we're definitely following it very closely. Clearly, CMP is failing across almost every measure of performance, um, and Maine deserves a better utility. Um, and if we could get to one that was owned by the owned and operated by the people of Maine, we would love to get there. Great, thanks, Pete. And uh, I'll stick with you uh, on another question uh, related to the CMP corridor um, from Bill Meserve, a, a board member of ours. Um, Bill asks, under the federal infrastructure bill, um, the federal government might be over, able to override state regulation of tra transmission line routes. Um, is that a risk for the future of the NECEC? Um, is there any worry that this, the new uh, federal infrastructure bill could um, sort of pave the way for, um, for the CMP corridor? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Nick or Jack, have you been following this? I mean, can you ask the question again, Todd? Sure. Um, it's from Bill Meserve. Um, under the federal infrastructure bill, I believe the federal government might be able to override state regulation of transmission line routes. Is this a risk for the future of the NECEC? And are we going to try to do anything to exclude NECEC from any such list? I, I have heard rumors about this. Um, I don't 
no um, the answer to the question. Um, I would suspect that the federal government would be pretty careful about um, forcing uh, the CMP corridor down Maine's throat after uh, a strong re rebuke from the Maine public and assuming that uh, the law court upholds um, the referendum. I, I, it's very difficult to imagine that happening. Great. Um, Jack, I'll pitch this next question over to you. It comes from Sam Staltenstall, uh, a 2021 NRCM Conservation Leadership Award winner. Welcome, Sam. Thanks for tuning in. Um, Jack, can you update us on the state of offshore wind development in Maine? Um, and is there any legislation uh, in Augusta this session uh, regarding offshore wind? Yeah, great question. Uh, great question. Um, uh, there, there isn't any legislation right now in Augusta around offshore wind. Um, the, but the current, current state there is um, the, the state's offshore wind roadmap process uh, is, is ongoing. Uh, many of the, the working groups from, from that uh, are sort of providing their initial recommendations, including uh, ones on energy, ones on uh, wildlife and um, uh, ones on wildlife, ones on fishing, about uh, onshore infrastructure and, uh, um, and, and really everything, everything under the sun. Um, there, there is a, a recommendation from the Energy Committee to uh, specifically set a carve out for, for offshore wind. Um, and, but that, that's coming a little bit further down the road. We've, we've heard from the federal government, um, BOEM, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, um, that they intend to designate uh, lease areas in the Gulf of Maine uh, in 2023 and to award those leases in 2024. And so the soonest that Maine might be able to do a, a procurement of offshore wind analogous to uh, what we're talking about with LD 1350 um, would probably be sometime sort of in the middle of the decade um, as uh, once those leases uh, are awarded and the developers are able to sort of put their projects together based on those, uh, those lease awards. Great, thanks, Jack. Uh, we've got a few more minutes for additional questions. If you have a question, please type it in the Q&A box. We'll try to get through a few more here before we hit the top of the hour. Um, Sarah, I'm gonna pitch this, uh, the first part of this next question over to you. Um, and then maybe I can pitch in on the second part. Um, the question is from Janice and she asks, what sort of resistance do you see against your goals in the legislature? Um, so maybe Sarah, can you speak a little, little bit about some of the corporations that we're, we're up against uh, in, in Augusta and um, what some of their arguments are? Yeah, um, for the out-of-state waste bill in particular or just in general? <laughs> yeah, I think the out-of-state waste bill. Um, yeah, so the out-of-state waste bill is really just, um, it's those, those two companies that I mentioned that are profiting off of um, importing the waste into the state. So one of them's in Lewiston. They don't actually, they don't really sell much out of their facility. They take on all this waste. They call themselves a recycling facility, but the only profit they make is basically the difference in be between what they're charging Massachusetts companies to send their waste there and then what they're paying to dispose of it in Juniper Ridge. That's their, that's their whole profit margin. So if we make it so they can't do that, there goes their business. Um, and then Casella, um, you know, they're a, a large for New England waste management company. Um, they manage our state-owned landfill and um, yeah, they're, again, they're profiting off of um, disposing of this waste in a landfill. They use it for different engineering purposes, um, which which keeps them from having to purchase stuff to use for their engineering purposes, like some landfills have to do. So it's just a more lucrative option for them to keep it. So those are those are really it. And then, you know, this this facility in Lewiston um, was bought by a, a global seven hundred billion dollar global asset management company called GCM Grover. So that's the company that's profiting off of, of this happening. So as, as with the case in most of the policies that I work on, they're typically large multinational out of state corporations, um, say with the uh, the bottle bill, it's always the big beverage companies with the um, EPR for packaging. It was Procter and Gamble and uh, Scott's Miracle Grow and all these these really big companies who are exploiting Maine's resources and are taxpayers for their profit. Great, thanks, Sarah. And the second part of that question, which I can speak to, um, are you know what can Maine Mainers do um, to help advance our agenda in the legislature? Um, and um, you know Maine has a citizen legislature, as Pete mentioned. The lawmakers that serve in Augusta are everyday average people, um, 
who live and work in Maine. Um, and uh, they uh, want they need to hear from their constituents. They need to hear from folks who live, uh, work and vote in the districts that they represent. Um, and lawmakers rarely hear from their constituents on, on many issues. So if a lawmaker gets a phone call or an email or, or a handwritten letter um, from a couple of constituents on an issue, it can have a really big impact on, uh, on how they vote. So I certainly encourage everyone here to look up who their lawmakers are. Um, all that information is, is right on, online on the, the legislature's website. Um, they list their phone number, their email address, uh, their home address if you wanna write them a letter. Um, so Maine lawmakers are, are accessible. Uh, they're certainly less accessible now during the pandemic uh, because they're not uh, doing their work in Augusta. Um, but that's why it's even more important, I think, uh, for lawmakers to hear from folks in their district uh, because they're, they're not working in Augusta. They're, they're working uh, mostly from home. So I encourage everybody here to, to take action uh, this session on, on the environmental issues that, uh, that we've covered here this evening. Um, let's see. Um, so Jack, maybe I'll pitch this last question over to you. Um, question is um, about the, the growth of solar in Maine uh, and how we uh, protect agriculture and farmland uh, from, um, especially prime farmland, uh, from, from being kind of swallowed up by renewable energy generation. What are some of the um, solutions uh, to, to that issue? Yeah. Yeah, so there over the past year, there has been a, a group um, called the Agricultural uh, Solar Working Group, um, snappy name, um, working on on some of this exact this exact problem. Um, you know, we there are a bunch of things that we need at the same time. Um, we need to build a lot of solar and renewables to meet our climate goals, um, but we also need to make sure that. Um, that development is happening in the right way and in the and in the right places. Um, and Maine is a you know Maine is a big state and, and we should be able to accomplish both of those goals at the at the same time. Um, so there are some recommendations that are coming out of that group that I believe there's a placeholder bill. I, I'm forgetting the LD number um, now in the Environment and Natural Resources Committee. Um, but one of the ways that one of the one of the things that we're very interested in is uh, is the citing amendment uh, to LD 1350. Um, what that amendment would do is again it would it would sort of insert into the way that the PUC evaluates these projects um, to look at um, the specific attributes of those projects. Um, now in the in the past there's some precedent for this um, uh, in some past procurements. Um, uh, citing attributes were, were part of the uh, evaluation criteria, uh, and that included um, not being cited on prime farmland um, uh, as, as defined by uh, as defined by the state government. Um, so, so we have been able to achieve some of this in the past, um, and we want to make sure that we that we do it again, and that we're sort of working towards baking that citing, citing criteria in um, as we do the very necessary work of, of expanding renewable development in Maine um, because we have a, a very, very strong climate imperative to do so. Um, so uh, so that's, that's sort of how we're approaching that. Great, thanks very much, Jack. Um, so we are uh, past our, our one hour. I really appreciate everybody for, for joining us this evening and for your great questions. Um, thanks to everybody um, uh, on staff who joined us this evening and for your hard work at the legislature as well. Um, just a couple of last minute items. Uh, as I mentioned at the, the beginning, this webinar has been recorded and you'll receive an email uh, tomorrow with a link to watch the recording and uh, share it with uh, your friends and family. Um, that, that email will also include links to our fact sheets and, and information on our website about all the issues that you heard this evening. Um, so be, be sure to keep your eyes open for that email uh, coming through tomorrow. And uh, the legislature runs through uh, probably the end of April. Um, so these issues uh, will be uh, on the legislative calendar in the, in the coming weeks. A couple of these issues are already scheduled for public hearings or work sessions. So um, the, the next few weeks and months will be uh, pretty busy and uh, we'll keep you updated uh, on all these important environmental issues. And lastly, as Pete mentioned, our legislative priorities uh, webpage uh, on our website is a great place to uh, learn about these bills, NRCM's position, when a public hearing is coming up, a link to our testimony. Um, so certainly check out the legislative tracking 
page on our website and the email tomorrow will have a link to that page as well. Um, so thanks again to everyone for joining and uh, we will see you see you again soon.